lesson is a familiar story. It's Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. Nicodemus, the Pharisee, who has come to see him in the dark of night. And if I ask anyone if you can recite a verse from the New Testament, it's usually John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I always ask people if you're going to re remember that one, then memorize the one that comes next, John 3.17. For God did not send the world, Son into the world to condemn the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. We're picking up a few verses beyond that this morning. Just a short passage of the conversation between John and Nicodemus. This comes from the third chapter of John's Gospel, verses 19 through 21. And this is the judgment, that light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who can do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There are two fish living in Mexico, two varieties of fish, and they're really the same except for one thing. One is called the Mexican blind cave fish because it lives so far under the water in caves that not only has it lost its ability to see through the years and through evolution, it has come to have no eyes because it's never going to be able to see because it is going to be completely surrounded by darkness. There is another variety of fish that is virtually identical except for the fact that it lives above the caves. It lives in the part of the ocean where light penetrates the water and it has eyes. Now, why am I talking about fish? Fish are symbols of Christianity, but that's not what I'm talking about this morning. We're going to talk about darkness and blindness. I often shy away from using blindness or deafness as some sort of spiritual state where people are refusing to see and hear, because for all the years I worked in deaf ministry, I remember my lay leader in deaf ministry we would often go out and we would do concerts, sign language hymns for folks, and they'd allow people to ask any questions they wanted about deafness, and they would answer as honestly as they could. And someone usually during the evening would raise his or her hand, and I would voice the words I knew were coming. Someone would say to him, I will pray for you to be made whole. He would sigh, and he would answer in sign language, and I would voice for him, I have been made whole in Jesus Christ my Savior. I just can't hear you. Even to the point that the sensitivity to these issues of blindness and deafness and physical disability. Now, I know that scripture promises one day that the blind will see and the deaf will hear and those who are not able to walk will leap for joy in God. That's a different concept than what we're talking about here. But to equate someone's physical reality with spiritual shortcomings is very difficult to the point that when we sign amazing grace, how sweet the experience that saves a sinner like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was confused, but now I understand is how we sign that. Because we're not going to say that someone is blind. But that's what we're talking about this morning in terms of spiritual blindness, being in the dark to the point that you no longer are able to see. So instead of looking at it as blind versus seeing, let's look at it as dark as opposed to being in the light because that's what Jesus is saying. If you want to think of this in terms of blindness, think about the apostle Paul, who started out as Saul, the persecutor. Saul, who was a Pharisee and half Roman. Saul, who hunted down Christians and had the authority to bring them back to Jerusalem so that they might be prosecuted and put to death. What happened when he saw the light of Jesus Christ, when he heard the voice of Christ? He was knocked off his high horse into the dirt and made blind because the light was so overwhelming to him. Think of yourselves if you've been in the dark, either at night stumbling around in your home because you don't want to turn on the light and disturb anybody else. But then it takes a moment, doesn't it, for your eyes to try to adjust to the light? But then when you turn on the light, it's sort of harsh because your pupils are fully dilated. That's sort of what we're talking about this morning, what it is to go from darkness into light. I think the Apostle Paul's conversion is the ultimate expression of 
darkness into light. And think about that as we look at the passages we read this morning. I said that John's epistle is very much like John's gospel. And if you remember Jesus at the Last Supper, that last evening, his last discourse, his last teaching with his disciples, he says, I'm giving you a new commandment, love one another. That's what John is saying here in the epistle. But he's saying, what I'm teaching you is not new, but it is, because it's a new way, a new reality of being in the world. And he's very blunt, isn't he? If you hate your brother or sister, you are living in darkness. If you hate, you are living in darkness. I think about the man who wrote the hymn Amazing Grace. His name was John Newton. He lived in darkness. He was a slave trader to the point that he had risen in the ranks to become the captain of several ships that would go between England and Africa to collect and deliver slaves. And at one time, he himself was even enslaved. He was captured for a time until he escaped. He lived as a slave. It made him a little bit more compassionate toward the slaves that he was taking from their homes to enslavement in the British slave trade. But then there was a storm at sea, and he nearly died along with those members of his crew and those slaves that they had in the hold of the ship. And he prayed for deliverance, and God answered his prayers, and the seas calmed almost as if Jesus himself had calmed the sea. It was that quick. And he understood that to be God's action. And he credits that as his first conversion experience. Because at that time, he started to read the Bible every day. He started to pray every day. He stopped cussing. He gave up profanity. He gave up hard liquor. And he gave up all his bad habits, gambling with the other sailors on the ship. But later, he says he came to a full understanding of who Christ was. And that's when his life changed completely. That's when he wrote these verses that we know by heart. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. He went from the captain of a slave ship to an abolitionist. And as an abolitionist, he became an ordained pastor. It took him a while. It took him over 10 years to go from the time of understanding that God had saved him from the storm. But he was still sort of stumbling in the dark until he came into the light of Christ that said, you cannot enslave another human being. You cannot diminish that person's humanity. You cannot say that that person is not created in the image of God and continue doing what you're doing. Because walking from darkness to light encompasses all of us, not part of us, but all of us. You can't say, I hate him, or put it in other words like, I just don't like that guy. I can't stand him. I don't want to be in a room with him. I will not deal with him. I will not pass him the peace on Sunday in church. I will look in another direction. I will sit as far away as I can from him so I don't have to deal with him or her, whoever it is. Whenever we stop communicating with another person in the family of faith especially, but if we hate people because of who they are, where they're from, what they've done, we are living in the darkness. We're stumbling around. We're not fully in the light that is ours in Jesus Christ. To be in the light doesn't mean that you stop drinking, smoking, and cussing. All those, if you've got problems with those things, I advise you give them up in the name of Jesus Christ. But don't let that be, don't let your personal piety be your expression of living in the light and being in Christ, because that is not it. I have been so troubled this week looking at what's been happening again in Washington. Whether or not you believe that a member of the House of Representatives should be kept from serving on a committee because of things she has said or posted, what troubles me more is the fact that with the cross around her neck, she takes a picture of herself with a gun pointed at other members of Congress and likes on Facebook someone's comment that says, Nancy Pelosi needs a bullet to her brain. With a cross around her neck. 
I'm not going to condemn her. I'm not going to say that she is not a Christian, but I'm going to say she's kind of still stumbling in the dark. To be able to say those things, to say that Jewish lasers have started forest fires here and that there really was no airplane hitting the Pentagon. I happened to be on the phone with a friend of mine whose husband was working in the Pentagon when that plane hit. And he survived. But he talked of the devastation that he saw and the lives that were lost and the damage that was done. To deny that parents are grieving children who died in school shootings and to demean them with a cross around your neck does not give the light of Christ to anyone else. So what we say has to match who we are and how we live. Isaiah had it right. God doesn't want our religiosity. God doesn't want our crosses around our necks or our fish on the back of our bumpers if we're not going to live a life of love and service, if we're not going to be the hope of the world that Christ has called us to be in his name until he returns. Because he says in the passage we read this morning is our call to worship, I am the light of the world. But then remember what he said, what we talked about a few weeks ago. You are the light of the world. You're a city on a hill. No one lights a lamp and puts it on a stand and covers it with a bushel basket. You put it on the stand so it gives light to everyone in the house. Why? So others can see your good works, not to pat you on the back and say what a good person you are, but so that they may give Glory to your Father who is in heaven. That's what Isaiah is saying. God doesn't want our religiosity. God doesn't want our ritual. God wants us to let our light shine. And what does he say? Is this not the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of injustice, to do, undo the thongs and the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke, to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin, then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall bring up, spring up quickly. And then what we ask God to do, God will do, because God will listen to us, because God will know that we have chosen to live in the light. The story of Nicodemus has to be taken in the fuller context, just like the passage we read this morning, where Jesus is saying, this is the judgment, light has come into the world, people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Nicodemus is one of those people sort of stumbling in the darkness because he has come to see Jesus under the cover of darkness so the other Pharisees don't see him. He doesn't want to be condemned. He wants to learn from him, and he senses in him something powerful and wonderful and of God, but still he comes under the cover of darkness at night to see him. What does Jesus say to him? You've got to be born again, son. It's a new commandment. It's the old thing, but it's done over in a new way. You have to be born again. You have to come into the light. Just like when we're baptized, we go into the water in the old sense of baptism. Sprinkling works too. I'm going to tell you that right now. But if you've ever gone underwater swimming and you come up and the light and the sound floods through you, that is what it is to come into the light, to be born again, not to enter again into your mother's womb because that's where Nicodemus got so confused and lost, but to come fully into the light of Christ to be born again. And I said we have to take it in the fuller context yet. What comes after the third chapter of John, but the fourth chapter of John, where the woman at the well comes in the fullness of the noonday sun to draw water, and a man speaks to her, an unheard of thing, and a Jewish man at that, even more so. And he tells her who he is. And even though she has been shunned because of her past life, she runs to tell others. Those who had scorned her and abused her and abandoned her, she runs to tell them that she has found the Messiah because she has chosen to live fully in the light. We're coming quickly upon Lent. And Elaine sang a beautiful song that is really a Lenten song. It's really a Good Friday song about how when Jesus was hanging on the cross that the darkness came for three hours as he hung there. And it seemed that darkness was going to overtake the world, but it did not because we are people of Easter. 
So we need to move fully into Easter, even as we move into the season of Lent, that season of reflection and repentance, that season of introspection where we look into our own hearts and say, what is it that keeps me from living in the light? And in the name of Jesus Christ, we push them out once and for always. That is what we're called to do. So the choice is yours. Will you live in darkness? Will you live in light? You can try that middle ground, but it doesn't work. Either you diminish your own witness to Christ, or you just don't quite get there. So look at John Newton. None of us can say that we ever captained the slave ship, that we were that far from understanding who Christ is. But we can say that we've been like him when we sort of put up with the world the way it is, when we put up with oppression and injustice, when we put up with poverty surrounding us, when we Look at other people and blame them for their own circumstances. Instead of becoming the light, walking into the light, fully entering the light, letting the light enter us, and changing who we are once and for all to the glory of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, because then our light will shine in darkness. Then his light will shine through us. Then we will know what it is to truly be in the light. The choice is yours, dark or light, Good Friday or Easter life or death. Choose the light, always the light. To the glory of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, amen.